Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So something I often get asked within my capacity as a antique sword dealer is um, I get sent pictures of the 1897 pattern sword or any of the, um, this. although this video is going to focus on the 1897, it could be any of the current regulation swords that are worn for ceremonial purposes. And a lot of people um, refer to them as dress swords and ask me, in fact, is this just a dress sword or would people have used it? Um, and <laughs> I get asked this question, this is one of the most common questions I get asked actually in the antique sword uh, kind of world by people who aren't antique sword people, so people who don't necessarily know about them. And um, the basic answer is, certainly in the British Army, now it's not to say there aren't dress swords, so what a, a dress sword for the most part would be something like a court sword or a masonic sword or something like this which is another form of court sword. Um, the army swords that are current regulation in the British Army and for a large part this is true in most other militaries as well, maybe with the exception the US Marine sword maybe not, maybe a couple of the French swords maybe not, but um, it is intended to be a weapon. So what I've got here is a nice shiny example of a um, rifles officer's sword, in fact, from the very end of the Victorian era. But if you were in the rifles today, you could wear this absolutely on parade, okay? So that's where the confusion comes from. You could absolutely wear one of these swords and these are regulation for modern British Army officers. This would be for the rifles but uh, you'd have a slightly different hilt from this if you were in any other branch of the infantry or Royal Engineers. And um, But it's the same blade and Therefore, because they're used for ceremonial purposes today, they're seen as ceremonial swords. And it has to be said, a lot, well, most of the ones that you would buy today from most manufacturers that are making modern ones for modern serving officers are not functional weapons because of the quality of the blades. Either the steel is not good enough, or the heat treatment's not good enough, or just the overall construction of the hilt is not good enough. But whilst you could stab someone with one, uh, that if they were sharp, um, you could not, uh, you wouldn't be able to, tr or you wouldn't be advised to trust your life to it in combat against other people with swords or bayonets or whatever. Whereas the ones made at this time, so this dates to uh, between 1895 and 1901. How do I know that? Well, quite simply, the blade is of a type which was uh, patented in. Uh, 1892. So it's an 1892 pattern blade. Okay, that's the first thing. The rifle's hilt had actually been regulation since 1827, so that doesn't tell us anything. So we know that the sword is after 1892 because of the style of the blade, but this style of straight back strap that is fully checkered, as you'll notice, so it's checkered all the way up and has a very square almost rectangular section for your thumb at the top here, because that's how it's gripped in use. Um, that is the 1895 pattern backstrap that goes with the 1895 pattern guard if you're in the normal infantry. This has got a rifles guard because it's for a rifles officer. So therefore it dates to after 1895. If this had an 1897 pattern hilt, which this doesn't, I would know that it dated after 1897. How do I know that it dates before 1901? because it's Victorian. So if I look on the blade, um, I can see it's got Queen Victoria's cipher or monogram um, there on the blade underneath the crown, um, VR. So she died in 1901. So there we are, quite simply, I can say with absolute certainty, with no shadow of a doubt, this sword dates to between 1895 and 1901. So using a you know, variety of factors, my knowledge of sword patterns, but also the, the births and deaths of the monarchs, or rather the reigns of the monarchs. Um, so um, this is a late Victorian example. Now in 1895, let's say, or even in 1900, while swords were not used very often, they were used sometimes. Um, so if we go to the sort of end of our period that we normally consider on this channel, swords were used in World War I. The first British kill of World War I was done with a sword. It was a cavalry sword, but nevertheless, the first German killed by a British person in World War I was killed with a cavalry sword not a gun. Uh, the first British person was killed with a gun, <laughs> which uh, anyway, there we go, that's the difference. But um, the fact is that swords and bayonets were used in World War I. Uh, bayonets obviously were used a huge amount in World War I, swords less so. Although, as I've mentioned in previous videos, cavalry actions 
were more common in World War I than many people realise. Most people think about the trenches, but they don't think about what was going on outside the trenches. And in fact, there were lots of cavalry actions, particularly at the beginning of the war when everything was more mobile, and at the end of the war when it became all more, more mobile again. Um, and of course, if we look outside Europe, if we look to um, you know, the Middle East, for example, Lawrence of Arabia, um, and the war against the, the Turks, um, the Australian, you know, Gallipoli and everything like that, there were cavalry actions, including in, very famously Bathsheba, for example, where they used bayonets because they didn't have cavalry swords in a, in a charge on horseback using bayonet um, in hand like a mini sword. So hand weapons were absolutely, absolutely used in uh, World War One, but equally they were used in the, at the very end of the 19th century as well in campaigns in Afghanistan and India and uh, China, Boxer Rebellion, um, all over. Okay, so swords were still a weapon. They weren't a dress accoutrement, or they weren't only a dress accoutrement, at the end of the 19th century. So, coming back to the original point, when people ask me, is this a dress sword or is it a fighting sword? My answer is, yes! <laughs> it's both of those things. So, in pretty much every European military, your dress sword, the, 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 the ceremonial parade sword, was also your combat sword. Um, and they weren't two different things because you've got to get into the mindset of the time. The sword was a weapon. It wasn't just a part of your uniform. Every bit of this sword has been designed with combat in mind. The, the guard is utterly functional. You'll notice it's asymmetrical because a right-handed person requires more protection on the right-hand side of their hand than the left-hand side. The back strap is fully checkered to give a better grip. The blade, which in 1892 switched to a almost completely dedicated thrusting blade, you can cut with it but not particularly well, um, uh, is straight and there were huge amounts of uh, debate and discussion in newspapers of the day and military press talking about the effectiveness of this new thrusting blade compared to the older cut and thrust blade, sabre blade, which I'll look at in a second. So they were absolutely concerned about the efficiency and effectiveness of this weapon as a weapon. But in the same articles, they also talk about what it looks like. It's a very handsome sword, or it looks very good at one side, blah, blah, blah. So they're, com they're not separating dress sword from fighting sword. It's just a sword. It's an army sword. Whether you're in the cavalry and have a cavalry sword, or whether you're an infantry officer and have an infantry sword, or whether you're a pioneer, uh, you know, an engineer, and you've got a pioneer sword with a saw back, they're things that are part of your uniform and they're useful. Um, and I think in the modern world we see, we, because coming from a sort of maybe you're watching Hollywood movies and stuff, we, we separate things too much into these two separate things as, oh, well, that's just for looks or that's just for, uh, that's just for function. They're often related and intermingled. That's not to say that everybody at the time considered this the best fighting weapon. And as I've shown many times in previous videos, um, some officers chose something else. They had different opinions. Maybe they preferred a cutting sword rather than a thrusting sword. Maybe they preferred a different type of um, hilt or a different type of grip. So I'll just grab one example, um, which I've done an article about on uh, Eastern Antique Arms, antique-swords.co.uk, my website. Um, and this is an example of a rifles officer's sword from the exact same period as this. So the hilts are the same regulation. So in terms of meeting regulation for parade purposes, these are the same sword, okay? They both meet regulation. But you will see very quickly, and they, this one dates to 1897. I know because it's Wilkinson, it's numbered, I know when it was made and who it was made for. Uh, it's an utterly different blade. You can see it's very broad, it's got no fuller, and it's very well sharpened. And this was made for um, a officer with the surname Broadhurst in the 4th Gurkha Rifles. So his men were Gurkhas and he was operating predominantly in India and Nepal at the end of the 19th century and he uh, went to China with the Boxer Rebellion and in fact unfortunately he died in World War I. He was shot um, in World War I, uh, presumably carrying this sword or at least maybe not physically carrying it because a lot of officers during World War I ditched their swords and just carried revolvers um, if they were just trying to advance quickly on trenches. 
it was more about delivering your men who were your first weapon remember if you're an officer your first weapon is your men your, your job is to command them your job isn't to run around being a swordsman your job is to get your men to the trench to kill the enemy um, anyway and um, so yeah it's a completely different blade design um, so in this case the person had different opinions about what he wanted from a sword and remember of course the context of that is if he's in the Gurkha rifles he wasn't expecting World War One to happen and in fact that was later in his life of course he was expecting to be doing essentially policing actions and putting down small uprisings and stuff like that in northern India and Afghanistan um, these sort of areas in at the end of the 19th century and at that time swords were still weapons that were used and were regarded as real weapons so Dress sword, functional sword, same thing. Right, the final thing I'm gonna finish with is a sword I've got behind me. So this actually has the 1895 uh, pattern hilt. So again, this is the same date as the other two, but you'll notice it's a slightly different uh, design guard, and that's because it's for an officer of the infantry rather than the rifles. So those are rifles hilts. This is a line infantry hilt. Okay, so it's a slightly actually more protective hilt. This is a newer design. This is what came in in 1895, but the rifles, because they were always treated a bit distinctly, a bit of an elite, to be honest, they got to keep their design of hilt, which they had emotional connections to. But this, is this a dress sword? It's very shiny, or is it a functional sword? Well, again, it's the same thing. There's no difference between a dress sword and a sword. It's just a sword. It's just an army officer's sword, an infantry officer's sword. And um, this is a Wilkinson patent hilt, full width tang, as Broadhurst's sword was as well. But there is a difference with this because it's not entirely regulation. It has an older blade in it. Oh, there we go. In very nice condition, very well service sharpened. Um, this sword, if I remember correctly, went to the Boer War, Second Anglo-Boer War, and at the end of the 19th century. And it's very well service sharpened. Why is it very well service sharpened? Because it's a weapon, because people thought that they were gonna be used they thought that they might get into hand-to-hand -hand fighting. In uh, 1899 to 1901, the Boer War, the British Army very much expected when they went there that they were gonna be fighting battles with swords and bayonets and, and you know rifles and artillery as well, but they thought they were gonna be fighting conventional battles against the Boer state. Um, and uh, yeah, it didn't work out like that. <laughs> uh, the Boers quite correctly uh, for, for their play, play to their strengths. And there were some pitch battles, but by and large, they shot the British and ran away and then shot the British again and ran away. And that's what worked very, very well for them. And whilst the Boer War was obviously uh, ultimately a victory for the British Empire, it kind of wasn't, it was, a, it, was a, it was a, it was not, it didn't go well for the British Army. Um, so swords did not get used much in the Boer War although they did get used a little bit. Again, cavalry actions. Cavalry was sometimes able to get the jump on um, Boer forces, but it has to be said they predominantly operated as mobile infantry. So they predominantly moved quickly somewhere, dismounted, shot, quickly mounted up and moved off somewhere. But very occasionally they did go in with the sword and the bayonet um, to clear out positions. So um, this is this a dress sword? Is this a functional sword? It's the same thing. It's not, it's not a dress sword but it is a dress sword. Um, it, so it is, a, it is worn for ceremonial duties, but it is also expected to be used as a weapon. Just very briefly, why did they keep an old blade? Who knows, we never really know. It could be because they preferred the older blade and we know that some officers, they explicitly write in um, articles, diaries, newspaper articles, things like this, that they preferred the older blade and they didn't like the new dedicated thrusting blade. Other officers, I'm sure it was just a matter of economy and that they couldn't afford to buy the new sword, so they just got the new hilt to save a bit of money. Other officers probably literally just didn't care. They, they, they just went, ah, oh, stick a new regulation hilt on it. I'm fed up of all these sword updates. <laughs> um, so, so who knows? There's probably a variety of reasons. Um, but uh, I like to think that this person kept that blade because they thought it was a better type of blade. It is a lovely sword. I have often said that as a fighting weapon, as a sidearm, for that period, I think this is about the ultimate. The 1895 or 97 hilt with the straight 95 back strap, in this case a patent solid tang, so full width tang, and the cut and thrust blade, well sharpened, is about the optimum. I think that's, um, that's my preferred. So, you know, kind of modern, if I had to pick a sword, 
it would be something like that, I have to say. For purely aesthetic and fun reasons, I do love the flat solid, as they're called, so unfullered, uh, very wide blades. Uh, but to actually use, I don't know, they're quite, they're quite obviously heavier. They're more inertia when you move them. So these are a little bit quicker, uh, but this would do nice big chops. It's essentially much like a, it's almost like a basket hilt broadsword blade without the basket hilt. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up there. So that to, to conclude, you should have got the point by now. The difference between dress sword and sword or you know functional fighting sword there is no difference okay hopefully i can now refer people to this video um, when they ask me is this a dress sword would this have been used well yeah but when people say oh you know the the thrusting blade because it's so narrow and uh, this kind of thing you know it's not really a fighting weapon anymore it's just become a dress accoutrement complete rubbish um, it is absolutely an effective thruster a viciously effective thruster it's as broad at the base as the early sabers are and stiffer because it's rectangular section with a hollow ground uh, so-called dumbbell section for the first half so very very stiff and then it's got a nice nimble and very effective stiff point so actually as a thrusting weapon as a weapon this is as effective as a bayonet in fact more effective than some bayonets and uh, as and as effective as the cavalry sword as well um, it, it's it's a very very good thruster it's just gone down that evolutionary route where it's decided what it's going to be and it's just gone fully for it so as a thrusting sword as a thrusting weapon this is absolutely as effective as a rapier or um, a small sword or you could even say more effective than many uh, spadroons uh, and uh, but anyway it's very effective thrusting weapon no question just because it's narrow don't think it's somehow not a weapon. It is absolutely, and when you compare this to swords from other nations, I think it's very clear that the uh, 1892 blade was made with business in mind. And if we look at the period sources, written sources, newspapers, military journals, stuff like this, they talk about this new blade absolutely in terms of effectiveness and what it can do and whether it's better or worse than the previous blade. They're not talking about does it look pretty or talking about it as a dress weapon they're talking about it as a weapon anyway i hope that's been somewhat interesting to watch and i'll see you really soon if you're not subscribed already please click that subscribe button below give me a like unless you hated this and uh, i will see you really soon for another video cheers folks thanks for watching we've got extra videos on patreon please give our facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already cheers folks